Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel wherever you are in the world and so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing very, very well. I'm doing great, thank you very much, so much better and fighting fit again. So I'm very glad about that and I hope you're keeping yourself well. But before we continue, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And what we're actually hearing at this stage of the story is that a couple of people are in the ice cream parlour, Nancy and her daughter Clarissa, and they've met the neighbour, Mrs Clarence, who is telling them about her mother suddenly disappearing when it got incredibly hot. So we're about to find out what's going on there. So let's continue with the story. I managed to get my husband out of his chair. It was like raising the living dead, I have to tell you. He was totally nonchalant about my mother's disappearance. I don't mind admitting I wanted to throttle him by this stage. All he had to do was to tell my mother to not plant the seedlings and to wait until early in the morning. Not venture out in the middle of the day like that. But he did nothing of the kind. He was so caught up in reading the newspaper, I think. I urged him to help me look for her. But she was nowhere to be found and we were both absolutely mystified as to where she'd gone to. It would have been quite a walk for her to cross the field on her own and go into those woods, in the searing heat. But it was the only place I thought she could possibly be. You hear of people, don't you, when they've had hypothermia in fiercely cold conditions, actually throwing off their clothes, as irrational as that may sound, but they suddenly believe they're incredibly hot. And as a consequence, they absolutely freeze to death. It accelerates the freezing process, does it not? Something happens to the brain, doesn't it? People become somewhat delusional. I thought maybe the heat had done a similar thing to my mother, and she had aimlessly just wandered off into the woods and lost all sense of her bearings. And had she? asked Nancy, raising a brow. Well, at least if she was in the woods... She'd likely have been shaded by all the trees there, which should have offered her considerable relief from the heat of the day, I would imagine. Well, I'm getting there, said Mrs. Clarence, clearly determined to tell Nancy and Clarissa the entire story from start to finish, not sparing them any of the details. But that was Mrs. Clarence for you all over. She loved the details when it came to a story, and she was thoroughly enjoying telling this one especially as both Clarissa and Nancy were focused on her every word, as if her story had grabbed their undivided attention, and they were holding their breaths as to what she would actually say next. Mrs Clarence always liked an audience, even if it happened to be a small one. Well, me and my husband got on to the ATV as fast as we possibly could. We drove into the woods at a fast speed, hoping with all our hearts we would find my mother. I don't mind admitting to you, Nancy, that my heart was pounding violently in my chest at a dime to a dozen as we entered those woods. I was so desperately worried about my mother's condition. I was also very angry with my husband for his irresponsibility in allowing my mother out in the sun like that. I mean, what the hell was the man thinking? My mother can be bloody-minded when she wants to be. Sometimes she really needs to be reined in. If those tomato seedlings were suffocating from the heat, what had become of her? Those were my only thoughts. I think I was crossing my fingers and dotting my toes that I'd find my mother in one piece, but I wasn't actually sure that I would. But you did find her, I hope, asked Nancy. We found her all right. Lo and behold, there she was lying on a bed of leaves by the side of the creek with her clothes soaked to the skin, looking terribly pleased with herself. This time, instead of wanting to throttle my father, it was my mother's neck I wanted to wring. She should never have been out in the sun like that. Now here she was, soaked to the skin, her clothes absolutely saturated with water. She must have taken a dip in the creek. She was insouciantly lying on the creek's rather rugged bank, as happy as Larry, I have to say not remotely concerned about the angst and chaos that she had caused. Ma'am, I cried out, 
We've been so worried about you. What are you doing here by the creek? How did you manage to walk across such a big field to get here on your own? You're not a very strong woman. You're very feeble. You know it's dangerous to do that. You're not as strong as you used to be. And this heat is a killer. My mother just looked at me, so relaxed, as if everything was all perfectly fine. She said, He said you'd come for me, that I was to wait here for you and keep myself cool by the creek. He took me into the water, you know. He carried me like a baby in his arms. She giggled, you know. <laughs> the cold water, it woke me up. I got the shock of my life when I woke up. I must have passed out from the heat. I thought I was dreaming, you know. He was so big, but very nice, very kind. He said if he hadn't rescued me, I'd be a goner by now. I think he's right, you know. Everything went so black, so very black. I don't remember anything until I was in the water. What a relief it was, too. I was so hot, so very hot. What are you talking about, Mother? You are making no sense at all. You're talking in riddles. You're not making any sense at all. I think you're a bit delirious. Who is this man you're referring to? Whereabouts is he? My mother just shrugged her shoulders. He's not here any more. He's gone, hasn't he? But he was here a while back. He brought me here. Such a very nice gentleman. Such nice eyes. So much hair. Lots of hair. Very hairy he was. Ma'am, what is going on with you? Why are you talking like this? You're not making any sense at all. Who is this man you're talking about? What is his name? My mother looked at me as if she thought I was the one that was a dimwit for asking her. A very sensible question, I thought. My husband was obviously rolling his eyes in the back of his head in absolute exasperation. I think he thought my mother was embarking down the journey of senility, maybe going through the first stages down that path. And maybe he's right. I honestly don't know, Nancy. I know very little about mental health. But I will say this, I had quite the shock to find my mother drenched to the skin, lying by the creek in the woods, waiting with so much expectation for me and my husband to pick her up. It was all very bizarre. I must admit, said Nancy, cupping her face in her hands, that's quite some story, Mrs. Clarence. What did your mum say happened when she was planting those tomato seedlings? How did she manage to walk across the field to the woods and make it that way? It's quite a long walk across that field, especially in the heat of the day. It makes no sense that she could accomplish that. Your mother's pretty frail at the best of times. And for her to be on her feet like that makes no sense to me. I doubt she'd have the strength to make that walk. She must have had some kind of help, surely. Maybe there really was a man who assisted her. Although in this sequestered part of the world, I have no idea who he'd be, because we don't exactly run into random strangers around here, do we? Of course there was no random stranger, Nancy, running into my mother. You're beginning to sound like her now. Of course there was no man. There simply couldn't have been. That would have been absolutely impossible. You're probably right. Nancy agreed. It's just what you're telling me. Well, it just doesn't add up. I feel as if I'm standing over a jigsaw puzzle and trying to force the pieces together, but they simply won't fit. Join the club, Nancy. I've been going over and over this in my mind. So has my husband, for that matter. My mother has since gone into a dreadfully big sulk. She's refusing to talk to the both of us about the matter any more. She's completely shut down. She claims I think she's going absolutely hopping mad. 
She says it did happen and she's not delusional and she doesn't want to speak to me about this ever again. She's reverted to becoming like an insolent teenager, you could say. She was saying I don't believe anything she says because I think she's losing her mind and going see now. What did you say to that? What could I say, Nancy? Because she's absolutely right. I'm afraid that is what I've been thinking. Although, of course, it has occurred to me that maybe that stint she spent in the sun did something to her brain, just like it does when you're very, very cold. That's the only other explanation I can come to. Well, what exactly happened when she planted those tomato seedlings? Did she tell you how she ended up in the woods? Well, she said she'd been planting the tomato seedlings in the yard and suddenly became incredibly aware of how hot it was. She said she had the sense that somebody was watching her, but nobody was there, so she felt rather foolish about that. Now she believes the kind man was watching her and became incredibly worried and disquieted that she was working in the heat. He immediately came to her rescue, like an angel from heaven. Those were the words she used. Don't speak to me about them. I don't think she realised how over-the-top and nonsensical her story sounds. She claims she became terribly faint and light-headed, very dizzy, she said. She suddenly blacked out, toppled over on the ground, and luckily didn't appear to have hurt herself. Which in itself is a bit of a miracle, because my mother can be clumsy at the very best of times without wishing to be unkind. She remembered nothing until she claimed she found herself in this big man's arms, being held in the cooling water. Some water was being placed in her mouth, which she said she swallowed. She said the man was making strange, encouraging noises and speaking in a peculiar language. She thinks he might have been German, but she's not very sure about that. At first she thought it was all a dream and that she was imagining it, but then she said he was definitely very real. She's most insistent about this. But I'm sorry, Nancy. I don't believe a word of it, and nor does my husband. I'm just sorry I don't. She's talking absolute nonsense. I looked up heat stroke on the net, you know. It confirmed my very worst fears. Apparently heat stroke can give you abnormal mental status. Delirium and slurred speech. A little like if you're drunk. My mother was behaving exactly like that. As I was saying, the symptoms are not unsimilar to what happens to you on the opposite end of the spectrum when you're suffering from hypothermia. It would seem that both conditions can make you delusional and even, you know, hallucinate. I understand where you're going with this, Mrs. Clarence. I really do. And I appreciate everything you've been saying. But your mother is a very frail woman. She uses a walking stick to get around. It would have been physically impossible for her to cross that rugged field, to enter the woods and to get to the creek. It makes no sense at all. Surely she couldn't have got there on her own. Not in the sweltering heat, I'm afraid. You know what I think, Nancy, dear. I'm afraid she did just that. Now, I've heard of people with hypothermia walking over great distances, stripped of their clothes, virtually naked. They pass out and eventually die. Maybe the same thing happens when you're incredibly hot. Well, if the truth be told, I think she walked across the field to the woods, against all the odds, as strange as it may sound. Then she plunged into the water at the creek, and that water probably saved her life. It was the best thing she could have done because it cooled her down at once. Obstensively, I think she was hallucinating about this man in her head. She claims he was so tall, he would have been bigger than the front door. I mean, have you ever heard anything so preposterous in all your entire life? A man who is bigger than your front door. That just does not happen. Anyway, what can I say? Said Mrs. Clarence, rolling her eyes in exasperation. I'm telling you, Nancy, my mother's not right in the head at the moment. She doggedly refuses to admit that what she's saying is not making any sense at all. But then again, my mother's always been like that, you know. Never admits she's wrong about anything. I mean, when she was a girl, they were saying avoid eggs at all costs because they will ruin your cholesterol. But now the science has changed in that regard. 
We are told these days how good eggs are for our health. But my mother still doggedly believes they're very bad news. She refuses to change her opinion in that matter. She's always been like that. Well, I don't think any of this really matters, Mrs. Clarence. The main thing is your mother's all right. And at the end of the day, that is all that matters. Oh, she's all right, that's for sure. She's back to her usual cranky self, Nancy. And, of course, on top of it all, sulking all the time, because I refuse to believe her story. Honestly, Nancy, she's been driving me crazy with all this fictitious stuff that she's been spinning. I just wish she'd be bold enough to admit that she walked to the creek herself. But she's been delusional. Why don't you call me Candace, love? You did in the beginning, and now you're calling me Mrs. Clarence. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Candace. I really am. But don't worry about any of this. I really mean it. The main thing is your mother's absolutely fine. But she must be careful and not keep going out into the sun like this. We have no idea how long this heat wave is going to last. It's not good for her. She needs to be more vigilant. I did see her recently, though. It must have been three weeks ago in church. We had a long conversation together. She seemed to be in sound mind to me. So if she's a little off-centre at the moment, well, let's not kid. The heat is getting us all down at the moment. My husband travels around in his car, and I've never known him to be snappy. Well, not as snappy as he is at the moment. The heat doesn't bring out the best in us, I'm afraid. It makes us, well, not very nice to be around, I rather suspect. It certainly does that to me. You know, Nancy, you are the voice of reason. I think you are absolutely right. The same could be said about our household at the moment. I'm always bitching at my husband about the lack of air conditioning in our bedroom. He claims I want to sleep in a refrigerator. Maybe I do, but what's wrong with that? If the truth be told, we've all been at each other's throats recently. And the hot weather is to blame for most of this. You're right about that. What an extraordinary story, Nancy privately thought to herself, when she finally said her goodbyes to Mrs. Clarence, who she knew infinitely preferred to be called Candace, but she often forgot to call her by her first name. She and her daughter headed back to the farmhouse in her SUV, but little did Nancy realise that by the following morning, after a night that she'd never forget, when the most horrible nightmare would come to revelation, that she'd learned that Mrs. Clarence's mother was not going senile, and the hairy man who'd saved her in the searing heat was very real indeed. She'd also learned something so dreadfully disturbing that it would ultimately change the course of her life forever, in just a few hours, when things would never ever be the same again. But out of this chaotic devastation would be the dawning of new hope, and a much better life. But she would soon learn a whole lot more about the mysterious hairy stranger that resided in the woods, who would ultimately be responsible for ending the first flames of a great evil that had just been birthed, and could grow out of control like a raging fire that you couldn't put out if it wasn't stopped in time. Nancy really did like Candace's mother. She was an eccentric woman, not inclined to make up fictitious stories, but Heatstroke could probably play tricks on the mind, Nancy gleamed. She was glad the woman had recovered from her fainting spell in the backyard while she planted tomato seedlings that by all accounts had turned out to be quite the adventure for her. But how she'd ended up in that wood grove, God only knows. It had certainly left Nancy second-guessing what had really happened to Mrs. Clarence's mother that day. But she reasoned with herself that maybe some mysteries can never be solved. But she was wrong about that. The scorching heat of the Wyoming day seemed to blazingly last forever, as if it had no intention of abating, and so even the short drive from town back to the house had been insufferable, as the SUV's air conditioning unit seemed to be on the blink, and her husband Tristan said it was probably because she overused it so much during the summer months, which was probably true. Nancy left the windows wide open in the car, and the radio on to a station that had turned to static, Nothing appeared to be working in this heat, almost as if even technology had gone on strike and was protesting the weather. Nancy was very glad that her husband Tristan 
was away on business for a couple of days. If the truth be told, she never enjoyed spending time in his company. She didn't share these clandestine thoughts with any of her girlfriends, who were enviably so happy in their marriages. Sometimes Nancy felt like she'd drawn the short end of the straw. She had married Tristan when she was nineteen years old, because she discovered she was pregnant, and her father, who was very old-fashioned at the time, did not want his daughter's baby to be illegitimate, but he need not have worried, for Tristan, on learning about Nancy's news, had insisted the couple got married at once. If the truth be told, Nancy had never loved Tristan, and this was a realisation that always bothered her, like an itch that she could never locate, that needed to be scratched. She had always thought with time she might grow to love Tristan, or at the very least like him even just a little bit. But after twelve years of married life, she was not sure the word like could be applied to her husband. Perhaps it was all her fault, she reasoned. Maybe on her part there was an inbuilt resentment that she harboured in her heart for all these years against her husband, for insisting they got married so quickly. But I don't love you, she had told him. How can I possibly marry you? You're a pregnant woman. It's not as if we have a choice, is it, Nancy? She knew in her heart that if Tristan ever cheated on her or had an affair with another woman, that she wouldn't care a jot. So what did that actually say about the state of her relationship with Tristan? A small part of her would be relieved if she found the perfect excuse to leave the man. When she first met Tristan in her teens, she was drawn to the tall, larger-than-life, rather debonair man, who appeared to be easy on the eyes, and at the same time seemed to be enveloped in an aura of intriguing mystery. Rather like a wrapped-up Christmas present, you long to open because it looks as if it contains something incredibly exciting. But does it? That's the one hundred dollar question you have to ask yourself. We've all experienced at one point in time opening up a present that failed to live up to our fanciful expectations. And that was certainly Nancy's story. She'd heard somewhere it was the quiet ones you had to watch. It was true in the grand scheme of things. Nancy did not know Tristan any better than she had done when she first got married to the man. So what did that say about their marriage? She didn't really know what made him tick, and she wasn't even sure she even wanted to know the mechanics of that. If the truth be told, Nancy couldn't help but feel, if she was to find out her husband's secrets, or what was nesting in the muddied nest of her husband's heart, she wasn't sure she'd particularly like what she would see, for there was something about him that rather unsettled her. It was like a sharp tug in her lower guts that occasionally gave her cause for great discomfort. The only way she would describe it, when looking back on those feelings of hers, is she felt a sense of grave disquiet that she couldn't rationalise. In her opinion, Tristan was like a book on the shelf, gathering dust, where the pages are stuck together because someone accidentally spilt egg white on the pages. So even if you wanted to open that book, you can't, because if you try to do so, you'll only succeed in tearing up the pages. She rather suspected that if she did manage to prise those pages very skilfully and very carefully apart to find out what her husband was really about, she would be bitterly disappointed about what she would see. Or worse still, she would find there was nothing on those pages at all. No script, no items of any interest, only a book full of empty pages, one after another. And nothing could be worse than that. Or could it? Nancy did not realise that an empty book would be a lot more reassuring than discovering what her husband was really about. For many years she would look back and say, How could I not have seen it? But sometimes the monsters that we fear the most live under our very roofs. She had reconciled herself to the fact that in life you couldn't have everything. But when she miscarried the baby she'd been expecting at nineteen years old, she regretted her haste in getting married to Tristan, before there were any signs of her showing. She should have left it a little longer. She now felt as if she was stuck with Tristan for the rest of her life, as she had taken her marital vows before God incredibly seriously, for better for worse, in sickness and health, until death us do part. Tristan seemed devoid of emotion or sentimentality of any kind. Never once had he ever told Nancy that he loved her, or taken her out to celebrate an anniversary or birthday. Nor had he ever bought her a bouquet of flowers, or a bottle of perfume, or even a box of chocolates. 
Nancy had secretly wondered if Tristan was capable of loving anyone, apart from the family cat Bosman, who was quite a cranky fellow to say the least, and seemed to be the only creature capable of amusing her husband. Perhaps the cat mirrored aspects of his own personality, and that's why he liked him so much. When Nancy had fallen pregnant for a second time, with Clarissa, she hoped that the birth of her child would be the magic cure that would bring the couple closer together. But that had all been wishful thinking on her part, because in no way did that happen, as Tristan had so little time for Clarissa, and if the truth be told, he gave her no attention at all, or at the very least, very little. Nancy had very painfully observed her eight-year-old daughter trying her level best to win over her father's affections, because she so wanted her father to love her. When her father returned from a couple of days spent at work and away from home, Clarissa would greet him by throwing her arms all over her father, but he'd push her away gently and say, Not now, Clarissa. Nancy would watch her daughter, reaching out to him. Sometimes she'd draw him a picture, and Tristan would thank his daughter, but then discard the picture in the trash, as if it meant absolutely nothing to him. Nancy knew Clarissa was longing to be acknowledged, validated and appreciated by her father, like every little girl would want. But he didn't seem to have that natural paternal instinct you'd expect a father to have. Nancy had tackled Tristan about the matter again and again, and tried to actively encourage her husband to be more emotionally available to their girl. "'What do you want me to do?' he had asked her. "'I want you to be a father to her, Tristan. "'Why don't you read her some bedtime stories? "'Play with her a little. "'Take her to the creek for a swim. "'Can't you see she needs you? "'She really does. "'She wants you to be there for her. "'She needs you, Tristan. "'Every little girl needs a father in her life.' To give Tristan his due, he was trying his level best to work on his relationship with his little girl. But it was a struggle for him, and he was only doing it to appease his wife. It was later that afternoon, as Nancy was tossing a garlic-laden vinaigrette dressing into a French salad and putting it on the dinner table in a carved wooden bowl to eat with slices of thick cold ham, pieces of homemade crusty bread along with glasses of homemade cloudy lemonade, made with fresh lemons that she'd spent the afternoon squeezing. She was about to call Clarissa to tell her that dinner was ready, when her thoughts were rudely interrupted by the noisy, intrusive sound of a car engine rolling down the drive. The clanging sound of the rattling engine came to an abrupt and final halt, followed by the banging sound of a car door being slammed behind itself. Nancy knew the car belonged to her husband Tristan. He drove a monster of an SUV that had a very distinctive sound due to its diesel engine. It was an ugly, macho-looking vehicle that Nancy had never liked. Nancy could feel her heart beginning to sink, like a heavy stone being plunged into a deep body of water. Why did she always feel this bitter disappointment every time Tristan arrived home earlier than expected? It was rather like being told that a thunderstorm had been forecast for the evening ahead. She couldn't be happy to see her husband, like every other wife would invariably be, when their other half returned home from being away. Or were there other women like herself, she wondered, who felt so little connection with their husband, like she did. Tristan had not been expected home until tomorrow evening, so his impromptu arrival was not welcome especially on a searingly hot day like this, when the heat was really getting her down. So her husband arriving home made her feel a whole lot flatter, almost as if this insufferable day was becoming infinitely more claustrophobic by the second. She could hear the tap of little eager feet bolting on the landing and then hear her little girl sliding down the banisters like a fireman on his pole. Daddy's here! Daddy's here! Clarissa cried out excitedly. It was incredulous that her eight-year-old girl loved her father, even though he was impossible to love, much like their cat Bosman, who was always lashing out at Clarissa with angry talons and had often given her some nasty scratches that had actually drawn blood. But just like her father, Clarissa's love for the grumpy cat had never waned, not even for a second. Tristan was a very good-looking man. Everybody was telling Nancy that. 
but these days she was struggling to find his attractiveness, because when she looked at her husband, she felt absolutely nothing. Was it even normal to feel this emotionally redundant and disconnected to the man she was married to? Her husband looked extremely fatigued this afternoon. His wavy chestnut brown hair appeared slightly ruffled, as if he'd forgotten to comb it earlier on in the morning. He was wearing a very smart pair of navy blue chinos, and the blue and white striped shirt, obviously designer, rolled up at the sleeves. But he did look deflated, as if he'd been in a boxing match and had had all the energy vacuum suctioned out of him. But then again, did not everybody in Wyoming look this deflated, this discouraged, in such unforgiving heat? She watched him very closely, from a distance, removing his black duffel from the trunk of the car, and thrusting the large straps over his shoulders, as he marched eagerly to the front door. But there was a decided limp in his left leg that she'd never seen before, as if he'd twisted an ankle or something. She wondered how he'd done that. Nancy heard the keys jingling and the door being thrust open, followed by the delighted chorus of cheers from her daughter Clarissa, ebulliently rushing over to her father to greet him with a warm embrace. Daddy! Daddy! Clarissa cried out, throwing her arms around him like a rambunctious, overexcited dog. Daddy, you're back home! I'm so glad you're back home! Not now, Clarissa, said Tristan, pushing Clarissa away. I have had a very hard day. It's been a long day on the road. It's very, very hot. Sorry, Daddy, said Clarissa, pulling away from her father, unable to hide the disappointment on her face. It's not your fault, Clarissa. It's this god-awful weather. It's driving me absolutely insane, and I've sprained my bloody ankle to boot, so I'm not in the best mood, I'm afraid. It's been a bloody lousy day. The traffic out there has been deplorable. So many people driving like maniacs on the road. Half these bloody people should have their driving licences revoked, let me tell you that. Where is your mother? She's in the kitchen, said Clarissa. Daddy, I drew you a very nice picture. It's of a bird with a very big beak eating lots of worms because I saw a bird yesterday eating lots of worms so I copied it for you. Shall I show it to you now, Daddy? It sounds very nice, Clarissa. You can show it to me later. But right now I need something to drink. I'm dying of thirst. It's a bloody scorcher out there and I'm as parched as a dried up old riverbed. Nancy drew in a deep breath as her husband entered the kitchen. He had left his duffel bag in the entrance hall, which undoubtedly she'd need to unpack for him later. Hello, love, said Tristan, walking over to Nancy, who was wiping a couple of glasses clean with a tea towel to make them sparkle. Tristan kissed her on the cheek and then charged over to the large jug of icy lemonade on the kitchen table. The ice jiggled as he poured himself a glass and refilled it again and again, drinking over three glasses of cloudy lemonade in quick succession. Oh, that is so good. So refreshing, he said appreciatively. It's hit the spot. You're very thirsty, said Nancy. And you're home early. This is a surprise, Tristan. Clarissa and I weren't expecting you home until tomorrow evening. I thought you said you needed to visit the Brensons. They were requesting a demonstration from you, were they not? With that brand new Hoover. Change of plan, said Tristan. I'm home for a couple of days now. I'm sure Clarissa's going to be very happy about that, aren't you, Clarissa? Because it's your birthday in two days' time, and your father's going to be here for it. Nancy glanced at her daughter and gave her a bright, encouraging smile. I'm sure your father's tired, love, but he'll be a lot brighter in the morning, and then you both can have some fun together, I'm most sure. Yes, Daddy, you can take me swimming in the creek tomorrow. Sounds like a jolly good idea, said her father, managing to give his daughter a watery, rather insincere smile. Are you hungry? Nancy asked her husband. I've made ham and salad for supper. Looks delicious, said Tristan. I'm just going to wash my hand upstairs, if I may, and I'll join you in a jiffy. Where is Bosman? I think he's gone into the barn. "'chasing some rats. "'He brought in two dead rats into the house last night. "'Can you believe that? 
I think we've had an infestation in this heat wave. There was blood and guts all over the kitchen floor, and two decapitated rats that he left lying there for me to feast my eyes on. It was a dreadfully macabre sight. I had to clear it all up with my eyes closed. It looked like a scene from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I haven't seen anything like it before. So much blood. Honestly, that cat is the absolute end. Let him be, chuckled Tristan. He's just being a cat. That's what cats do. Besides, he's a great ratter. You should commend him for that. And don't judge him so harshly. The more rats he kills, the better for us as far as I'm concerned. Those nasty buggers need to be exterminated, the whole bloody lot of them, like some of my clients today. But sadly, some of those rats are far too large for Bosman to take on. Or otherwise, I'd gladly let him do it. You don't mean that, I'm most sure, said Nancy with a light laugh. You've had a rough day, that's all. The heat is getting everybody down. And in weather like this, we can say things we don't actually mean. Oh, but I do mean what I say, love. You have no idea how much I mean every single word. So there we are. That is the end of part two. Part three is tomorrow night. What an exciting story. I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.